Because it's all you've 
part four. You need to know I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ one. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. And for me, the Bible, the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the God-breathed, God-inspired, God-spoken word. So for me, his word, the Bible, is the authority, the authority over my life, over my day-to-day, -day, walking, living, everyday life. I'm talking about the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God, and so it provides for me guidelines to keep me in my lane. It provides for me guardrails to keep me from going over the edge, over my ego edge, over my cultural edge, over my political edge. You see, for me, the Bible contains the very mind of God. The Bible contains and communicates the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness that all believers will have. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. You should read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, it's the pilgrim's staff, it's the pilot's compass, it's the soldier's sword, and it's the Christian's charter. Jesus, and we are in chapter 17, his teaching on prayer, his teaching on prayer is extensive, especially in this sermon, this sermon, John 17. In the Sermon on the Mount, however, he taught his disciples a lot about prayer, and he taught them to pray for their enemies. That would be in Matthew 5:44 and to pray in private and with simplicity. That would be Matthew 6, 5 through 8. Jesus also taught them the need to be persistent in prayer. That's Matthew 7, verse 7. To pray with humility. He taught them to pray and pray in his name. That means based upon his character and based upon his authority. Jesus gave his disciples the model prayer in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11. And as important as that teaching is, it's enhanced by his example. And that's what we see in John 17. We've been looking at it. It's an example. This is really, really the Lord's prayer, more so than the model in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11. It is his prayer, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's the most extensive prayer, most extensive prayer that you're going to find in the Gospels. It reminds us of the importance that the Lord Jesus Christ put on prayer. So important that he wanted he, he, wanted he himself to be the example and the model for us to pray. It reveals the very heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. It focuses first on himself, and then his disciples, and then on us, his future church. In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 6, we see the prayer. We need to put everything in context. When did he pray this prayer? Jesus, this prayer, is recorded right the night of his betrayal, shortly before he was arrested. This is a prayer that he prayed just before, just after leaving the upper room on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. First, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed for himself. You got that. Then he prayed and he prayed for uh, the current, the present disciples, and then he prayed for us. Minister Connie, Reverend Connie, read you 9 through 19 in the NIV, the New International. I want to read it in the Amplified. It gives it more sound. This high priestly prayer. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you, Father. And all things that are mine are yours. And all things that are yours are mine. 
and I am glorified in them. That's why I pray for them. I am no longer in the world, yet they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them. Keep them in your name the name which you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them. I was keeping them in your name, the name which you have given me. And I guarded them and I protected them and not one of them was lost except the son of perdition, the son of destruction by his own choice so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Verse 13, but now, now I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you and I say these things while I am still in the world. Why? So that they may experience my joy, my joy made full and complete and perfect within them, fulfilling their hearts with my delight. I have given to them your word, your word the message you gave me. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world and do not, do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world and I do not belong to the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them. You keep them and protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. Your word is truth. Just as you commissioned and sent me into the world, I also have commissioned and sent them. These believers you have given me, I've sent them into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself to do your will so that they also may be sanctified meaning set apart, meaning dedicated, meaning made holy in your word, in your truth. You all want to hear what Eugene got to say about it? Yes. Eugene is a homeboy, right? Eugene puts it like this. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me. For they are yours. By right, they are yours. Everything mine is yours, and everything yours is mine. And my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue to be in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them. Guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift on them through me. So they can be one of heart and one of mind, as we are one of heart and one of mind. As long as I was with them, I guarded them. In pursuit of the life you gave through me, I even posted a lookout. <laughs> and not one of them got away, except the rebel bent on his own destruction, the exception that proved the rule of scripture. Now, I'm returning to you. I'm saying these things in the world's hearing so my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your word. The godless world hated them because of that, because they didn't join the world's ways, just as I didn't join the world's ways. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, consecrate them, do it with your truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I gave them a mission in the world. I'm consecrating myself for their sakes so there'll be truth consecrated in their mission.
his prayer for them, really his prayer for us. In verse number eight, the master says that the disciples had received his word as coming from God himself. Let me read verse number eight. That sets up nine through 19. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou did send me. That's what makes them disciples, and that's what makes us disciples. So what's the point, teacher? Here's the point, people. The master says that the disciples had received his words as coming from God. This confirmed that the Lord Jesus Christ came from the Father and was sent from the Father to his people. Jesus' words here are more than a statement about the disciples. His words here are really a prayer for his disciples, for their obedience and for their understanding of him. This, means by, this is the means by which he would be glorified. He would be glorified by the way his disciples lived. He'll still be glorified by the way his disciples lived. These words establish the importance of his petitions. What we're going to read from 9 to 19 are petitions. His requests of the Father for us. Petition number one, Father, confirm their position in you. Petition number two, Father, give them unity. Petition number three, Father, give them joy. Petition number four, Father, protect them. Petition number five, Father, separate and sanctify them. Petition number six, equip them. I'm going to do it again, and I'll do it at the end. Confirm their position in you. Give them unity. Give them joy. Protect them. Sanctify them and equip them. We're going to go verse by verse. A little different from what we've done for the last two Sundays, a word study. The word study of the world. And this morning, I would have summarized the little big word, give. So let's look at petition number one. Verses nine and 10. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine and they are mine. All mine are thine and thine are mine. And I am going to be glorified in them. You need to notice that when you read this, he doesn't say I'm going to be glorified. He says I am glorified. You got it? Father, confirm their position. You see, while Jesus didn't lack any uh, compassion for the world, his disciples were the object of his prayer. They were the ones that the Father had given him. We too are the ones that the Father has given him. And thus, we belong not only to the Father, but we belong to the Son. We belong to them both, Father and Son. And they were the ones through whom the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified. So are we the ones through which he would be glorified. And so certain was he of his glorification through them, he speaks like it's already done. That's because he sees the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. He doesn't say this is what they're going to do. He says it's done. They glorify me. You got it? This had to bring great comfort, and encouragement to disciples to hear him say that. So how should we feel when we hear him say that? Oh, confident and encouraged. Remember, the word comfort 
compound word, C-O-M, with, fort, fortus, with strength. We're strengthened when we hear him talk to us like that. We're strengthened when we hear him talk about us like that. That's why it would be a really wonderful thing to speak words of encouragement to them young ones while they're young. Oh, yeah, no, I ain't no C student. I ain't no B student either. I'm an AAA student. You don't know what that does for kids. My mother drilled this into me when I was a, a boy. You are my dependence. She wasn't saying that I was her dependence. I'm her a, a depend. She was saying, I depend on you. You don't know how that made me feel to have her say she was depending on me. You know what that did to that eight-year-old boy? <laughs> Now, she never called me man. That's where some mothers mess up. That my little man, no. My father was the man. I was the boy. The boy that she could depend on. Got it? That makes a difference. When you give them that kind of positive communication, she would call us into the kitchen when she would have friends. Now, I don't know what she did for the other one, but she said, this is my doctor right here. Spell town, T-O-W-N, spell down, D-O-W-N, spell bright. All I'm doing is rhyming words. <laughs> but you don't know what that does when you speak that to a kiddio and they believe you. You reinforce that. That's what Hope Academy is about. We get a chance to brainwash them kids. Get the negativity out that they get on television. It's to get the negativity out that they get from their parents. Get the negativity out they get. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of the negativity come from older siblings. God, that's our job, and I'm grateful for the privilege of being able to serve in that capacity. So he says, confirm them. They got a place with you. Make sure they know it. Got it? Now, the second one is to give them unity. That's verses 11 and 12. I'm going to read. And now I am no more in the world. This is King James. But these are in the world. And I come to thee. Listen to what he says. Holy Father. Keep through thine own name, keep those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, while I was with them in the world, I kept them. I kept them in your name, those that thou gavest me. I have kept, and none of them is lost except the one who by his own choice, perdition, the son of perdition, the son of destruction. And you know that was communicated in the scripture beforehand. Listen, Jesus knew that he would soon be leaving and he would leave his disciples behind. He would leave his disciples behind and therefore he said, Father, you keep them. I won't be here. While I was here, I kept them. But you know I'm leaving. You know where I'm going, and I'm being obedient in my leaving and going. I need you to keep them and preserve their oneness. Don't you know to a parent, nothing, nothing, nothing is more comforting and encouraging than to see their kids on good terms? How many ever heard a parent say, y'all stick together? Don't be fighting. Don't hit him. Don't call her that. Nothing disturbs a parent, father, 
more than to see that kind of disunity among his kids. If you want his kids, raise your hand. Stop fighting. Stop calling each other names. I know you don't do it in person. But he's on Facebook too. I had to call some folk out last week about what they be saying to each other in this family. Now, I ain't on Facebook. But everything y'all do on Facebook, come back to me. And some of them pictures, and this ain't my little girls in swimming suits. There's some baby boomers in swimming suits. Oh, you don't believe me? I got the pictures. <laughs> don't do that. I know how it is every once in a while to have a flashback. I was wearing 193. I came down to 178. I had me a flashback. Went and got my little Speedos and tried them all. <laughs> no. You ain't even going to see me in no short pants. Oh, boy. Y'all want me to stop right here? No. I had to get out here last week because I had to get to Pittsburgh. Or oh, I can hang around today. All right, okay. <laughs> Look, he says, while I was here, I kept him. That was my full-time job. It's like herding cats. I hate cats. They don't listen to you. Cats ain't loyal. Cats think they own the house. They don't listen to nothing you say. Try and say, come here, see what they do. I don't have to say nothing to them. When I had a puppy, I don't have to say nothing. All they do is come in the house. My puppy walk up and say, a cat. One of my neighbors had a cat. And, I, I, you know, he would come out, sit on the steps, and the cat would sit with him. And then for about a week, he was sitting on the steps. I say, where your cat? Say he moved in the next block. <laughs> I said, what you mean? Say it's a female cat, cat up there. He done moved up there and start, right? And you ain't going to believe this. We sitting on the steps talking, the cat came walking by. His cat. I say, call him. He called the cat, the cat looked at him and said, did like it. <laughs> <laughs> and kept walking down the street. I hate cats. Cats ain't loyal. But cats are like Christians. That's all I'm saying. He said, now, while I was here, I kept him. I kept him in my name. He said, but I'm gone now. Lord, and you the only one that can keep him. You the only one that can provide the unity that they need. I need to commit them to you, and I'm asking you to take care of them. Keep them together. Keep them close. And this kind of oneness I'm talking about ain't organizational oneness. It's not uniformity kind of oneness. It's organic kind of oneness. Organic as opposed to organizational. Organization is structure and, and because we connected and we're part of the same frat, no. Organizational is we're born of the same, not organization, but organic means we're born of the same mama. That's what makes us one. We got the same mama. We got the same daddy. I didn't choose you. You didn't choose me. We're born that way. That's organic oneness. And when you were born again, not only were you born free, 
but you were born into a wonderful family with a wonderful father. And if you remember anything from last week, he was a giving kind of father, habitually giving, consistently giving, continually giving. That was a characteristic of him. He was a giver. And the greatest evidence of his giving was John 3.16. He loved you so much. He gave you the best gift he could gave, give you. He gave you a one-of-a-kind gift. He didn't have but one son, and he gave that son to you for you. Somebody needs to say thank you. He so loved the world, he so loved you, me, he so loved Smitty, he so loved PM that he gave his only begotten son, his OBS, so that if Smith would just believe, accept, and receive him, I could have eternal life, which doesn't speak of quantity, it speaks of the quality of life I got that transcends the here and now. I believe that. Now, some folks think I'm crazy and, and this, that, and other, but I believe that. I believe that because of the source. I believe the Bible is the word of God. I've accepted that. And let's say I'm totally off the wall with that. I'm good with it because I've been blessed by that. I go to sleep at night. I feel all right. I wake up in the morning. I got an attitude of gratitude. Nothing sets your day right like a morning filled with gratitude. And the older you get, the more grateful you get. And it ain't that you got, well, you got a track where you got all these things you could be grateful for. But it begins with the little things that you took for granted when you were young. Get off that cell phone that you took for granted when you were young. It was, look, I, I, say, I, I say God bless you to young folk because I remember when I was young and I had more strength than I had since. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh? And because I had that strength, I didn't have to believe in nobody but me. Come on, come on, guys, when you didn't believe in nobody but you. You were more than sufficient. Raise your hand. You were a legend in your own mind. In your own mind. You thought you were perfect. Am I right? Come on, Rob. You were a good guy, but you weren't perfect. Come on. Every married woman in here, please stand. If you married, please stand. You married him, but you knew he wasn't perfect. Am I right, Miss Jones? <laughs> you just had a little mercy on him. You accepted him with all his flaws and all his imperfections. Am I right, Aunt Joyce? Am I right? Come on, Mick. Come on, Mrs. Mick. I mean, he's a nice guy. He had a good income and all that, but he wasn't perfect. You immediately saw his flaws. And you knew he needed some help. So you took him under your wing. <laughs> Am I right, Miss Williams, over there? You came all the way from Florida to take that boy from Westport under your wings and help him out. Do you understand what I'm saying, Miss Odom? Now, I can say that because my wife ain't here today. <laughs> Y'all can sit down now. Otherwise, she'd be trying to get a mic and testify. We ain't going there. I left her at home. I said, baby, rest today. <laughs> In fact, she said, you preaching? I said, no, I ain't preaching today. <laughs> she said, well, I don't have to go. I said, no, you can stay at home. I'll bring you some ice cream. <laughs> oh, boy. But we're talking about organic oneness. Oneness that we have because of our birth. We entered this new life with this oneness and with this unity that is ours. And he didn't pray that we would 
have unity, that God would, the Father would give us unity, we already had it. His prayer was, we keep the unity that he gave us. His prayer was that we would maintain the unity that we already had. Isn't that wonderful? We already got that unity. He's just praying that, Father, you help them maintain that unity. That's a thought for us as a church and for the church. We already got what he wants us to have. And we don't have to work to get it. We need to work to keep it. Am I right? Oh, well, that was that, that was that, that was that. Um, that second petition. Now, it's third petition, real easy. I want them to have the joy that we have. That's verse 13. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. Joy. The joy of the Lord is my. I wish you knew where that was in the Bible. The joy of the Lord is my. Joy is a product, a byproduct of your relationship with the Lord when that relationship is right. You experience joy. That means your priority is right. How do you spell joy? Your priorities are right. Jesus, others, and then you. When your relationship with him is right, you experience that joy and you live it because you got your priorities straight. Jesus, others, and then you. The problem, and it's natural, for us as human beings is me first. That's natural. You need the supernatural to overcome the natural. And that supernatural is the Holy Spirit of God, which is yours when you're in that right relationship with him. He lines up your priorities. He takes the self out of selfishness. I sit down, I do a lot of, well, first of all, the function of the church is family formation because family is foundation for everything. It's the first institution God created, not the church, but the family. And the church is just a larger family of families. So our function as a church, and I want you to remember this when somebody come at you and want to challenge what the church is doing, well, our first is family formation because that's foundational to everything. No neighborhood and no community going to be any stronger than the families that are there. No child is going to be any stronger, be any more blessed than the families. And right now, you got to look around and see that our families are fractured. So if we talk about the real issues nobody want to acknowledge is family, number one. And families without fathers, that's number two. And I'm going to give my father, as an example, my father drank. But he was the head of that household. All right? He was the head of the household. And I appreciated him more in his leaving than in his presence because I realized how much I needed him. There wasn't a whole lot he could do for me but his presence. Right? Jesus, others, you. Try that. That'll change your life. But you only experience it if you have the spirit of God, the relationship with him that enables you to do that. Now, ain't nobody in here more egocentric than me. At least I was. Until I had to come to a a real tough reality. The world did not revolve around me.
That's na natural. That's human nature. Kids are born that way. They're born making demands. Feed me. Change me. I can't sleep. Wake up. <laughs> And part of the maturity process is growing out of that. Jesus, others, and then me. He says, Lord, give them the joy that I experienced with you before the world was ever created, me and you. I want them to experience that unity, and out of that unity, J-O-Y. Here's the fourth petition. The fourth petition. Verses 14, 15. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now I pray, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, don't take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil in this world. Protect them. That's his petition. His petition, real simple. Let's make sure we got everything right now. His first petition, petition number one, was confirm their position. Number two, give them that oneness and unity that only comes from you. Number three, the joy that we have, let them experience that joy based on a right relationship with you so they can spell joy and know what J-O-Y really stands for and now I want you to protect them. You know why? Because the world ain't going to be kind to them. Ms. Hagens, I have to talk to them fifth graders, you know why? I spend a lot of time with them because they cry babies. They so soft. I've never seen kids so soft as they cry babies and they getting ready to go to middle school. Number one, it ain't no place like this place, meaning Hope Academy. And if you gonna cry every time somebody talk about your shoes or talk about your hair, if you gonna cry every time you get three wrong, you ain't gonna make it. You gonna be a sixth grade dropout. <laughs> you gonna hate school. So part of it is tightening them up. Tightening them up. The Browns got a couple little girls in there, and I got to start real early with them. I tell them, you know, somebody ain't going to like you because you're tall, because you're short, because you're light, because you're brown, because you got thick hair, because you got thin hair, because you wear glasses, because you don't wear glasses, because you snags or whatever. And they probably come at you because you're a straight-A student and say, you think you're so smart. You know what the response is? Uh-uh, you think I'm so smart. That's the problem. You think I'm so smart. That's the problem. You got to have a retort. You got to have a response. Now, the baby boomers had one. We knew sticks and bones, sticks and stones didn't break out. But we wasn't letting you have the last word. We wasn't letting you have the last word. All right? Am I right, Tookie? You wasn't getting the last word. Am I right, Joyce Ann? Am I right, Joyce? You wasn't getting the last word. That's because we grew up with six in the family, right? And you learned how to be tough in the house. Am I right, Ben? You learned how to be tough in the house, right? And if you came, came outside and things didn't work out your way, you had an older brother that could handle things for you. I feel sorry for these kids who are only kids. And it's just one or two of them. I used to, I used to hate the fact there were so many of us but I couldn't decide which one I didn't want there. <laughs> They're already here, so how can I pick which one? I, I wanted to be an only kid. I'd have more stuff. <laughs> Just didn't work out that way, and I'm glad that I'm not by myself, because when you go through rough times, it's good to have somebody with you. When mom and daddy gone, it's good to have somebody with you. Am I right? 
So he says, I need you to protect them. The world is going to come after them, and the world is going to come after them because of their relationship with you. They're going to acknowledge you. They're going to honor you, and the world is going to make them targets. So we got to let them know, baby, you're going to be a target, and you got to be able to respond. Get off that cell phone. You know I'm looking at you. I got my eye on you. Yep. So here we go. Jesus said, keep them because they're going to hate them because of their relationship with you. There'll be opposition to them from the world because of their relationship with you. And I need you to keep them not only from evil, but from the evil one. How many know there is an evil one? He's the father of lies. He's the father of death. There is an evil one. I have to tell young folk who, my young folk are born knowing a whole lot of stuff. In fact, they know everything. And so I have to say, I talk to them about their philosophy of life, and they got it all figured out. They're brilliant at 13. They're even more brilliant at 23. But I have to back them up and say, now, I know you done thought it through in your philosophy of life, you got this conclusion, but if your philosophy of life does not include a philosophy of death, you need to go back and rethink your philosophy of life. Is that fair? I know you, I know you're 23 and you ain't thinking about that, but you haven't experienced the loss of a loved one. You haven't had to face issues that could so rethink your philosophy of life make sure it includes a philosophy of death and maybe you'll come to the one who can conquer death maybe you'll come to the conclusion that death is a doorway to greater life at least that's what I'm taught by the teacher do you understand what I'm saying so he says, I need you, I need you to not only give them joy, but I need you to protect them. And the same protection that he gave them, he's given us. Got it? We're going to get in this lesson to the fact that he says, sanctify them, let's separate them, Sa separate them and use them for your purpose. Got it? And until you fulfilled your purpose as a child of God, you bulletproof. In fact, that's what number five is, petition number five. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This word sanctify means set them apart. Make them know they're special in a different kind of way and different in a special kind of way and help them accept that difference. Now, there'll be folk that'll know it's something different about you, but they won't know what. And they'll come at you, Dennis, because they recognize that you're different and your difference makes them uncomfortable. So they're going to come at you for no reason at all because you're different. No that the difference that you are is the difference that he has made you, and it's okay. Accept that difference. That's why I say you're different in a special kind of way, and you're special in a different kind of way. God made you that way. And the next thing is, therefore, you're destined. And really, really, Harvey, that's, a, that's what all of us really want to do. Make a difference. Ultimately, we want to make a difference. You can't make a difference unless you be different. So that's why we got to teach Cornelius, you're different in a special kind of way. And you're special in a different kind of way. God made you that way. Therefore, you're destined to make a difference. Is that okay? We call that an affirmation. Y'all know what an affirmation is? A statement, a positive statement. To me, about me, to encourage me. You know why? Because in the world, your children are gonna grow up and they ain't gonna get a whole lot of encouragement. They're gonna get a whole lot of opposition. 
And so here's a lesson from David. You got to learn how to encourage yourself yourself. You got to learn how to encourage yourself. You got to teach them how to encourage yourself yourself, right? You're special in a different kind of way. You're different in a special kind of way. God made you that way. So you're destined to make a difference. That's an affirmation. An affirmation is a statement, a positive statement to me, about me, to do what? To encourage me. Because in the journey of life, Miss Barbara, you got to learn how to encourage yourself yourself. And the sooner you learn, Ms. Dolores, how to encourage yourself yourself, the better off you will be. Got it? You got to learn how to encourage yourself yourself. When you're under attack, when things ain't going your way, when you slide, and when you got to learn, Jack, how to encourage yourself yourself. An affirmation to me. It's about me. To encourage me. You're special in a different kind of way. You're different in a special kind of way. And it's okay because God made you that way. And you're destined. Grandmother, remind Amaya of that. You're destined to make a difference. Got it? So I need you, Father, to sanctify them, separate them. You keep them. I'm gone. They're in your hands. Keep them. Protect them from the evil one. Make sure they understand their special difference and their different special. It's a gift from you. You made them that way. Now, here's the final one. We looked at his petition to confirm their position, to give them the unity that they may maintain it, to give them the joy that only comes from him, that right relationship, to protect them, to sanctify them, and now, Lord, just equip them to do what you've called them to do. What would that be? Please say, reach the loss. Equip them to reach the loss. Equip them so they can recruit for your army. That's not 18 and 19. Thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. To do what? To recruit the loss? To advance your agenda? to enlarge your kingdom by sharing your word and inviting others to become a part of your forever family by recruiting for your army. That's what you sent me to do and now I am sending them to do that. I need to ask you this. How many churches do you know have evangelistic outreach? How many are on a corner any time of the year? How many have a broadcast outside of the walls of the church? How many not only invite people in, but go and where people are? Reach the loss for the Lord. That's what evangelism is. Because the Lord loves the loss. He loved me when I was lost. He loved me when not, I was not only lost, I was lost and hiding. Because I wanted to do my own thing. I didn't want to line up with him because I seen old people talk about how good God is and how blessed he is and they pray the same prayer every Sunday. And I, don't know. I didn't want to line up because old people lined up. But then I grew up. You know, there's a commercial where this guy be joking young people for being old people like their parents. What's the name of that? They selling something. What, what, you, you, you know what I'm, this guy just looks at him and say, no, don't do that. Stop that. Don't barbecue like that. You're acting like your father. You're acting holy. You know what the key to that is? And, and my daughter helped me with that. Uh, she ran into a lady and they say, oh, you done changed. Yeah, well, when I started here, I started here as a janitor. Now I'm a supervisor in charge of 12 people. And when my responsibility changed, I changed. Right? Aunt Joycey? <laughs> yeah, I started off throwing mail as a clerk. But then I became supervisor and postmaster at an office. 
and I'm responsible for more now. So when my responsibility changed and increased, you still expect me to act stupid like I did when I was a clerk? Changing my time card, coming in early, leaving, no. I became more responsible because of responsibility. Translation, I grew up. The one thing that helped me grow up was I got married. That's a show sure enough sign that you are growing up when you say, come here, little girl. I want to take care of you the rest, as long as I live. I want to take care of you. I want to help you buy a car. I want to help you do what you want to do, right? I want us to build a family. I ain't got a whole lot of money, but I'm willing to sacrifice. In fact, you can hold my money. Because <laughs> I know what happens when I try to hold my money. You hold the money. You do better at that than me. Just let me know I got a little something, something. I need gas money. I need some Tasty Cake money. I need some Mountain Dew money. And I'm good. When I start, well, I started off giving my mother my money. She, I could trust her with my money. And then she set me up. So when I got married, I gave my wife my money. She does a good job handling money. She counted down to the penny, should I wake up 2 o'clock in the morning, and she on the phone fussing at somebody at Bank of America trying to get that checking thing right. No, I don't do that. I let her do that. But she got it to the penny. Did I tell you we were married, I had, we had kids, and I didn't have no life insurance? Wouldn't even think about it. Oh, you think I'm going to die and leave you some money to go off and run off with somebody else? I ain't doing that. I am not doing that. No. Mm -mm. When I die, I might not take it with me, but I ain't leaving you. No. <laughs> and she didn't fuss with me. She said, um, she took about a week. And she came back, Larry. She said, um, do you think our kids will go to college? I said, yeah, they were kids. We went to college. They going to college. She said, well, how are they going to pay for it? I say, I'll pay for it. She said, suppose you did. <laughs> I ain't had no answer for that. <laughs> and she said, that's what life insurance is for. <laughs> Got it? I say, you call them, you set it up, bring them in, we'll talk, and whichever you wanted, that's what we'll do. That was an area of responsibility that I hadn't really acknowledged or assumed yet. Yeah, I grew. Ain't, ain't growth about change? And change about growth? Yeah, I have grown, right? I grew in my sense of responsibility, and it changed the way I dealt with life on a daily basis. Got it? And let me say this, and then I'm going to finish. I hate to admit it but I'm more like my father than I ever thought I would be. Holy, who left these lights on in here? <laughs> Burning up my gas, my <laughs> gas and electric, right? Holy, does it have to be on 77? <laughs> Can it just be on 71? Well, when you leave the house, cut it off. No, we ain't turning on no heat until the Friday after Thanksgiving. That's when we're going to turn on some heat. Cole, well, what you think the Lord made hoodies for? <laughs> Miss Janet, I hate to admit it, but I am more like my father than I ever was. Come on, Rob. I'm more like my father than I ever was when it comes to things like that. All right? I've grown. More responsibility. 
So I've changed. And the people who know me and love me are glad I changed. Anybody in here grown in the last year or so and experienced a change? All right. Anybody near you, you want to turn and say, thank God for the change. Thank God for your growth. It's a wonderful thing. So what he says is what he says, I need you to equip them. All right? Don't just get stuck in your saved and satisfied state of salvation. Remember who you used to be. Remember how you used to be. And remember the Lord who saved you loved you enough to send somebody. Right? Loved you enough to send you to somebody. When the last time you handed out a track? I go to Sam three times a week just to hand out tracks. I run up on the young folk and say, young lady, young man, you're doing a good job. In fact, I used to beat you. I used to have this job. Here, take this, just in case I never see you again. Well, I'm going to be here. And I say, yeah, but I'm an old man. I might not be here. So just take this, read it. You're special. Tell your mother that an old man saw you and told you to tell her she done a good job with you. They ain't mad with me, Jeff. Who mad when an old man say, you done good. You show this to your mother. How many kids your mother got? Four? Well, t I don't know about the mother three, but she done a good job with you. Ain't nobody mad with me. Do you understand what I'm saying? You got to reach. That's part of not only what the church does, that's part of what the Christian does. Because somebody reached out to you. He sent somebody to you. You got it? So this is his prayer. This is his prayer for, his petition to the Father for his disciples. And if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Lord, please. Confirm them and make them solid in their position. Lord, please help them maintain the unity that you've already given them. Lord, please, the joy that will characterize their lives as Christians, as the church, may they experience it. And since I'm leaving them in a hostile world, protect them. And while they're in this world, make sure that they understand how special, different, and different special they are because you have a purpose for them. And they're in your divine witness protection program until your purpose for them has been fulfilled. And always give them a mind and a heart to reach somebody else on your behalf. Does that make sense? Now, you can do that directly or you can do that indirectly. We have a sick list that is read every Friday and every Wednesday. Miss Yvonne got address. Go to the dollar and a quarter store and buy a box of get well cards. Let me see. Is Isaiah, Isaiah, stand up, man. You led us last Wednesday. Stand up, Isaiah. Don't play with me. <laughs> you led the 555 prayer last Wednesday. Am I right? <laughs> Who would have thought it? Been working with this boy ever since he was in middle school. Your mother here, but now, now stand up, I'm talking about you. Ever since he was in middle school. Used to put him out of class, Steve. Used to put Isaiah out of, but he's grown up to be a fine young man. Isaiah, you growing up, man. You done changed. You got a little bit more. You got a job? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you got a car? Uh-huh. You, you looking for a wife? <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't do that, because I know the young lady you asked me about. Just say, yes, I'm looking for a wife. Oh, come on, Isaiah. Just say, yeah, I'm looking for a wife. I'm looking for somebody I got married. And then turn over and say, Chris, 
Stand up, Chris. If Chris can find a wife, you can find a wife. <laughs> All right? It's time, Chris. It's time, Isaiah. I got married when I was 30. How old are you? I'm going to give you 20, 20 months, and then you got to find somebody. I'll find you somebody. But these are two fine young men, and they've grown, they've changed, and it's been my privilege to watch them grow, mature, and change. So look, man, you woke up. What time you wake up so you can lead at 5.55? Stand up. Big voice. What time you wake up so you can lead? Because you were on time. I didn't ask for no commentary. What time did you wake up? 4.30, good. I'm going to give you some ice cream. All right? I got it in the back. So we done. Look, I hope you got something out of this. This is the Lord, his high priestly prayer. And keep in mind why he says it's a high priestly prayer. Because it's the priest that comes from God's people and intercedes with God on behalf of the people. He's interceding. This is an intercessory prayer. He's saying, Lord, keep them. Lord, protect them. Give them the joy. Equip them. All this is intercession. That's his high priestly prayer. And here's the reality. As the priest, not only he functioned as the priest as the intercessor, inter intercessor but the priest had to make an offering. He was both. He was both the priest that interceded for you, and he is the one who sacrificed himself for you. And you can only say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask brother, where's brother Eric? Come on, Eric, get a mic. Larry, can you help him? Go get a mic. He's going to stand right here. He's going to extend the invitation. Y'all be praying. Because last time he extended the invitation, it was an overflow that came down here. So, Eric, take your time. Stand right in the middle. Good morning, family. Good morning, sir. We're grateful for this time. Because uh, now is the time. Uh, a decision should be made. We're at a tipping point, and it's time to choose Jesus. Mm -hmm. He has uh, been waiting patiently for you, and you know who you are. For some of us, we've been waiting 15, 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 years. You know who you are. There's a certainty that I have developed from the word of God in knowing that I'm saved. I like to share with the young ones that I get a chance to teach sometimes, that Jesus gives us eternal life. And I always say, how long is that? How long is eternal life? And we shall never perish. How much time is that? Never perish. And the good part, nothing, no one, no man can snatch us out of his hand we have an assurance if we trust Jesus Christ. And if you have any doubts, it's all in his word. So we're going forward this morning and we're praying that if you have any doubts, you can eradicate them. Now is the time. The election is over. The craziness has set in. People going on Facebook and everything crying and hollering out. They call this man Hitler. They said he's going to start World War III. They said he's going to put us back in chains. As soon as he won, all of them started capitulating. And they're leaving us out there hanging. But we trust Jesus. <laughs> Our trust is in the Lord. So we're going to stop insulting each other and just trust in the Lord. Now, all the people who said that, they're trying to start World War III. The people who said that, they're letting in more illegals than ever. 
leaving us to stand on our own. And if you're going to stand on your own, you better know Jesus. You better know Jesus. And it's good to have one another. To be in the body of Christ. To be on the winning team. No matter what goes down. Every day I wake up, I can give thanks and say it's a good day to be alive. But you know what? If I don't wake up on this side, I'm going to wake up on the other side and still give thanks. It's a good day to be alive. So would you trust him? Confess that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and accept him as your Savior. The ABCs, I just did it backwards. Trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's someone who needs to know that they have an eternal insurance to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Draw them, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Thank you, sisters. Draw, Lord.